Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to the webinar series of Black Lives with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities and their faith communities. It is a discussion of the role of church communities in the lives of black and brown people with IDD and their families. This is the third session in our four part webinar series that explores the intersection of faith, race and disability. The webinar is brought to you today by AAIDD's Religion and Spirituality Interest Network, as well as the University of Minnesota's Institute on Community Integration. So thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sarah Hall. I am a researcher at the University of Minnesota. I am also the current chair of the Religion and Spirituality Interest Network. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available for you in the future on our website. And the PowerPoint also will be available on the Religion and Spirituality Interest Network's website. The web address is on your screen, but we will also send that to you um, in the follow-up email. Next. So today, um, for this webinar, all attendees' microphones are on mute. Um, but please feel free to share ideas, questions, and anything throughout the whole presentation in the chat. You can see on the bottom, there's a chat button. It looks like a speaking bubble. Um, so please put anything in there. If you have questions, you don't have to wait till the end. Um, let us know what you think. And my colleague, Chet Cheddar, will be monitoring the chat. And some of those questions that you put in there, we will put in the discussion at the end. And if there's things we can't get to, that's our that's for our last webinar. We will be answering those questions then as well as um, talking about other topics. Now, closed captioning um, has been turned on. So you can turn the subtitles on and off by clicking on the live transcript function at the bottom. So you will have option to show subtitles. And if you change your mind, you can hide subtitles later. So please feel free to do that. Next. So to tell you a little bit about our interest network, the Religion and Spirituality Interest Network is an interfaith, interdisciplinary association that seeks to advocate for the opportunities and support needed for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to express their spiritual religious interests, their needs, their gifts, and to assist service providers and congregations in embracing inclusion. Now, members have access to the Journal of Disability and Religion. We also have a lot of activities we do throughout the year at the AAIDD conference. We have activities throughout the conference, such as a dinner, a business meeting, and a forum, which is um, a post-conference session. And each year, the Interest Network presents the Henry Nowen Award at the AAIDD conference. And we have a website, Facebook, and Twitter to share information throughout the year. Next. So now I will turn it over to Deborah Fisher to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you to all of you who have joined us today. I am very pleased to introduce our uh, speaker, Reverend Lamar Hardwick. He has his doctorate in ministry from Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary and is the lead pastor at Tri-Cities Church, Church in East Point, Georgia. In 2014, at the age of 36, Lamar was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. He writes and speaks frequently on the topic of disability, especially autism, and he is the author of the best-selling book, I Am Strong, The Life and Journey of an Autistic Pastor. His forthcoming book, Disability and the Church, A Vision for Diversity and Inclusion, will be released on February 9th, 2021 with InterVarsity Press. Uh, he will give us more information about how we can get his book and uh, he will have more information at our final webinar uh, about the book. And so with all eyes to Georgia, 
today um, nationally and here. I thank you, Dr. Hardwick, for joining us and turn it over to you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, thank you uh, for all those who are attending. Uh, again, as she said, my name is Lamar Hardwick. Uh, and so today's session is really about uh, myself and my relationship to my church. Uh, and so because the theme is primarily about relationships, I thought I'd start with um, just a brief part of my journey and my story. Uh, in 2014, after uh, several years um, of struggling with uh, social anxiety, uh, sensory processing issues, uh, and a host of other issues that I had no label or descriptor for, um, I sort of ran into a wall. At that time, I was already uh, in ministry, but had had a very difficult time um, trying to find my place within the church and find my place as a leader. Uh, and so uh, I ran into a proverbial wall uh, as I was being considered uh, to be the lead pastor of my former church that I pastored for nine years. Um, and I finally went to uh, get some assistance after hearing uh, comments such as Lamar's facial expressions and body language um, makes him off-putting. Uh, comments such as um, his facial expressions, body language don't mirror the room. Uh, and so after years of denying, deflecting, and defending, I finally uh, decided that everyone can't be wrong. Uh, that there's something that they are experiencing that I'm not experiencing. Uh, and so I finally decided to try to find someone to help me to make sense of why I had such a difficult time in uh, relationships. Uh, and so in December of 2014, I was diagnosed on the autism spectrum um, with um, what, what the DSM-5 uh, labels as Asperger's syndrome. Um, and so there are uh, a couple of challenges that I'll talk about on, uh, on this journey today. And so um, a, a big part of me being able to relate well uh, with my church uh, is actually my family. And so uh, on my right there uh, in the picture, you can see my wife, uh, Isabella. We uh, will celebrate 20 years of marriage uh, on the 20th of this month. And so uh, we were married before I was diagnosed. And so that my diagnosis also helped to strengthen our ability to communicate and to relate to one another. Uh, and then you see our three boys, our oldest Malachi, uh, on my wife's right, uh, year left on the screen in front of her is our youngest Miles. Um, and then on my left or your right on the screen is son, uh, Micaiah. And so uh, as we talk about relationships, it's important for me to help you to understand that a significant part of my ability to relate well with my church uh, comes from uh, an ability to relate well with my family. Uh, and I should say, after my diagnosis, uh, my wife and I spent two years with the therapist that diagnosed me uh, just to help to give me tips and tools and strategies um, to address some of the lifelong challenges that I had been struggling with prior to my diagnosis. So one of the um, things I think about most often when it comes to um, my relationship to my church uh, comes from uh, sort of a, a mentor who I never got a chance to meet, but Nancy Eastland in her book, The Disabled God writes, uh, the history of the church's interaction with the disabled is at best an ambiguous one. Rather than being a structure for empowerment, the church has more often supported the societal structures and attitudes that have treated people with disabilities as objects of pity and paternalism. And for many disabled persons, the church has been a city on a hill, physically inaccessible and socially inhospitable. Uh, in a lot of ways, that statement has to do more with the relational components of uh, disability, the social components of disability, rather than um, the medical ones. And so certainly there are uh, things that we can identify for those persons who have disabilities that uh, may be challenges or barriers uh, medically. 
but more often than not, uh, particularly when it comes to the church and persons like myself having an ability to relate well to the church, more often than not, it's not the physical, intellectual, developmental part of the disability that's disabling. Often, more often than not, it's the social uh, implications and the social structures that the church has helped to perpetuate that becomes even more disabling uh, for persons like myself. And so I thought as I talk about my own relationship with my church, um, it would be good to perhaps um, raise some some principles that have helped me to be successful uh, in an attempt to help perhaps someone to understand um, the power that the church has to, uh, to be a guiding force, but also a stabilizing factor in the lives of persons with disabilities, and also to help us to understand uh, the tremendous value that persons with disabilities bring to the church when um, the environment is right. So I want to just pose a, a thought uh, in John chapter nine, and you can read this, it's on the screen, I won't read it. Um, but most of us have, have read this story uh, when Jesus and his disciples walk up on a man who was born blind and his disciples, because in that day, uh, this was a legitimate question. Was it because of his sins or his parents' sins? That was the thought process in that day. Um, that that his disability or persons with disabilities was a result of some kind of form of punishment. Uh, either that person or their parents or someone in their bloodline had sinned. And Jesus actually does something interesting that I think helps to set the stage for how to how I relate well uh, with my church and perhaps maybe uh, it can help set the stage for how those who are watching can begin to relate better to the disability community. So when they asked him this question, uh, Jesus basically says, that's not even a great question. Uh, the question should not be, uh, why can't this man see? So a better question, uh, when Jesus says that he was born so that the glory of God may be seen in him, Jesus does something interesting. He changes the question from why can't this man see to how can God be seen? Uh, in his life. And so I, I often say that disability ministry, and when I say disability ministry, uh, not just for people with disabilities, but ministry with people with disabilities, it's often uh, a delicate balance of acknowledging what a person was born with. And perhaps um, that person may not have been born with a disability. They may have uh, had some kind of traumatic accident, but it's a balance of acknowledging what they were born with. At the same time, it, we acknowledge and honor what the person is born for. And uh, when you talk about having a healthy relationship, that is sort of the foundation of how I'm able to relate well to my church uh, in the face of some of the challenges that I have and some of the challenges that people have in understanding persons on the spectrum and also other persons with disability. It's an acknowledgement that uh, we can acknowledge the, the ways that I'm different, uh, but also honor um, and acknowledge the things that I'm actually good at and perhaps purposed and born to do. Uh, and so it's, it's a delicate uh, but important balance in being able to do that. Um, so I, I want to tell a quick story um, because I'm a preacher and I'm a storyteller. Um, so there's a story of a woman who, was, who f had fallen ill and unfortunately she passed away uh, and she ends up uh, going to heaven. And so uh, as she gets to heaven, she's standing at the gate uh, and Peter's at the gate. Now, don't ask me why. I don't know why in every heaven story, Peter's always at the gate, but we'll just say it was Peter. Uh, and so she's looking through the gate. She sees her family and her friends waving and they're excited to see her. And she asked Peter, well, how do I get into this place? Uh, and Peter says, it's simple. All you have to do is be able to spell one little word. And she says, well, what's the word? And he says, love. And she says, well, that's simple, L-O-V-E. And so Peter says, hey, congratulations. Welcome to heaven. Uh, enjoy your time here. Your family and friends are waiting for you. Well, uh, about 10 years pass and the woman's walking around and she runs into Peter and Peter's frantic and Peter's um, looking distraught. And he asks, he grabs her and says, hey, um, God really has me busy today and I need someone to watch the gate. Can you possibly watch the gate for me? And she says, sure, no problem, Peter. And he says, now remember, if anyone shows up at the gate, remember the word that they have to spell 
to gain access? And she says, yeah, it's love. And he says, great, watch the gate, make sure they spell the word, everything will be fine. And so as she's standing at the gate, her husband shows up uh, and she's so excited to see him. Now his family and friends are at the gate, they're waving and so excited to see him. And she's excited to see him and she asks him, uh, hey, before I let you in, let me know what are some of the things that happened after I died? Like, how did life go? He says, well, you're probably not going to hear this, but I had I missed you so much that um, about six months after you died, you're, because your sister and you look alike, I kind of married your sister after you died. And she just steps back and rubs her chin and says, oh, really? Uh, and then she says, well, tell me what else happened after I died. He says, oh, you're probably not going to like this either, but um, about six months after I married your sister, we hit the lotto on $150 million. And she leans back, squints and says, oh, really? And he's looking at all his family and friends and they're waiting for him to come in. He says, look, enough about me. How do I get into this place? And she says, oh, it's, it's simple. All you have to do is spell one little word. He says, well, what's the word? Uh, and without, without even blinking, she says, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> And it's a funny story that I like to tell because it raises a couple of issues. Um, one, it raises the issue of uh, no matter what your faith background is, uh, most faith backgrounds and religions have an ideal um, place. Uh, and for Christianity, it, heaven is, is sort of the ideal. It's, it's where everything we believe is uh, the way that God intended it. Uh, and the second part of the the story that's funny is um, she was the gatekeeper to the access to the, that ideal. The reason why I bring that up is because as it relates to me being able to relate well to my family and perhaps other persons with disabilities, be it intellectual, developmental, or physical, uh, one of the things that I believe Dr. Eastland was talking about is uh, oftentimes persons with disabilities don't have a great relationship with the church because they are not given access to the ideal. And so a lot of um, even what I talk about in my forthcoming book is to understand where our, our ideals come from. Um, and oftentimes, if we peel back all the layers um, in many churches, their ideal picture of church uh, is void of disabled bodies. And so uh, anytime that we create spaces that we consider to be ideal, our, our worship services, this is our ideal, our Sunday school classes, our Bible studies, our small groups, this is the ideal, uh, and that does not include uh, disabled bodies, uh, it's, it's hard to call those environments and those ideals sacred. Uh, so, so I would start with, and this has been very helpful for me as a pastor on the spectrum, is to start with let's find out what the ideal is. What is your ideal of a pastor? And what is my ideal of being a pastor who um, may not be like a typical uh, pastor? And so the question that I would ask and challenge the church to ask and persons with disabilities who seek to be in leadership is ask what type of relationship do we wanna have? Or what does it look like for me to be the pastor of your church? What type of relationship are you looking for? And then how will we define that uh, a successful relationship between uh, the pastor and the church? And so what I found is that there are, uh, at least from myself, and this may be generally true of persons on the spectrum, is that there's a couple of challenges um, in relating, um, especially in the West, because church is a highly social environment. Uh, and these are some of the common challenges that are general to most people on the spectrum. Uh, and I say general uh, at the risk of generalizing everyone, um, but communication, uh, anxiety, uh, social cues, which uh, was something that and I continue to struggle with um, and oftentimes self-awareness. And so um, what I learned is, is that when we're able to discuss um, and to be able to learn, uh, we can create a, a proper environment that can help uh, to overcome some of these challenges without dismissing persons who very well may be some of your best uh, leaders and volunteers in your church. 
Um, so for me, those are the four common things that we had to work on that helped me um, to be able to better relate, but also the inverse is to help them to understand how to better relate to me. Uh, and I'll share a little bit more about that. And so one of the, one of the um, sort of foundations for creating an environment uh, actually came out of out of a story Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 13 verses 18 through 23. So I'm not going to read that. I'm just going to give a synopsis because many of us heard it. It's, it's what's called the parable of the sower. Uh, and in that Jesus talks about a farmer scattering seeds and uh, the seeds fall on different types of soil. Uh, the first three types of soil don't allow the seed to grow and produce. And the last soil uh, was correct. But what's interesting about that and the principle that I was able to extract from that uh, to help me uh, to be the best that I can be for my for my church and for the church to be the best environment for me is Jesus never in that story places the weight of the success of the growth of the seed on the seed itself. Um, for each environment, he said, for each uh, of the three environments before the last one, he says that it's the environment that was not allowing the seed to grow. And I share that because oftentimes uh, the focus when it comes to persons with disabilities, especially persons like myself who struggle with social anxiety and social cues, the focus is more on trying to change or fix what the seed is than it is creating an environment that allows the seed to flourish. Um, so for me, just like the story, the heaven story, uh, accessing the ideal had to be about creating the right environment. Uh, and the right environment increases the potential for a successful relationship and sex, successful growth. And so if you read that story, Jesus says the reason why the seed didn't grow is not because of the seed. An apple seed will produce an apple tree if it's placed in the right soil. Uh, and so for both churches that I've served recently, that meant having to do things differently and change the environment so that the things that I'm most naturally gifted at can come to the surface. Uh, the right environment also provides an opportunity to showcase strengths. Uh, and oftentimes it's, it's because the environment is not the right one that you never really get to the things that a persons with disabilities can bring to the church because the environment only accentuates the things that they may struggle with um, and not accentuate the things that they are strong at. And then lastly, the right environment affirms dignity. Uh, when Jesus doesn't place the blame on the seed, he's saying that the seed is uh, and contains everything that God intended it to be and to produce. It's not the seed, it's the soil. Uh, and so in being willing to make some adjustments, what I've learned is that uh, the church was in a way affirming my dignity by saying, we're not going to expect you to be something that God never created you to be. Instead, we're going to create an environment that allows you to flourish and that honors and affirms the dignity uh, of all persons with disabilities. And so there's uh, three things that uh, we extracted from that, that has helped me and our church to have a really great relationship. Um, and it, again, it goes back to that story. Uh, the first seed, Jesus says, hits the ground. And um, because there's a lack of understanding, he says that there's there's no faith. And so in essence, it's, it's about creating a healthy environment a healthy learning environment um, that allows for a person like myself to be highly successful. And so when I say learning, it has it, what we've learned is that we create an environment that preached about taught about and educated uh, our congregation and our community about autism and about other disabilities, you would be surprised uh, with all the awareness campaigns, how much people don't know uh, about autism and or other disabilities. And creating an environment where learning is open um, helps to create uh, an opportunity for persons like myself to have a really great relationship with the church and to be really successful because people are open and to constant and consistent learning about uh, the things that, that I struggle with, but also the things that uh, I'm great at. Uh, and then I also say education through narrative that we use a lot of stories and not statistics. Statistics are great uh, if you're focusing on the medical model of disabilities and stories are great if you're foc focusing on 
uh, the social implications of disabilities. So people tend to be more open to learn and to tend to be more graceful um, with some of the challenges I have when they understand the stories behind the challenges and not just the statistics. Uh, the other thing that we learned in creating a healthy environment that has allowed me to thrive is we create a linking relationship. If you notice in the parable, Jesus says the second seed hits the ground and things are going great, but it falls away when the sun, and he later interprets it as life's problems, start to beat down on the plant. And the reason why it falls away is because it doesn't have great roots. Uh, and one of the things I often say is if you want to be inclusive of those persons in your community with disabilities all the way up to leadership, um, create a, a place for them to have roots, not just a place for a room for them. Um, one of the ways that we did that and has been tremendously helpful for me and others in our congregation uh, that have intellectual development or developmental or even physical disabilities is we begin to approach it by the way that Jesus says that it's, it's the cares of life that it calls them to fall away. And so when we create linking, a linking environment, we're talking about creating relationships that uh, address the real life needs of people in your community. And so for me, that meant um, having people surround me uh, and to be in my small group and to be on our leadership team that addressed the real needs that I had, my needs for uh, assistance because I have executive functioning challenges, the needs that I have with sensory processing. And so the small groups weren't just groups for themselves in and of themselves. They were support groups that address real needs. Uh, and in doing so, it, it helped me to be able to have a better relationship and to flourish. Uh, and then the last thing uh, I'll share is um, leadership. I, I'll often say that you can tell a organization's commitment to uh, disability inclusion by its uh, pathway and its access to leadership. Uh, and so uh, oftentimes churches will say that they want to be disability inclusive, but you have no persons in leadership that are helping to shape what it looks like uh, for you to do church. And that's important because for most people, this is a barrier for persons with disabilities. For most, most churches have created their environments without the voices of people who can give uh, great input into what the environment needs to look like so that persons like myself can thrive. And so when you have all the same voices who are creating the environment, then you end up with an environment that doesn't allow the seed to produce what God has uh, intended it to produce. And so it's important to have persons uh, with disabilities on your leadership teams who are crafting the environments that help uh, others thrive all the way to the highest tiers of leadership in your church or your organization. And that also means that you have to make accommodations for the assignments that you give. Um, for myself, I don't have a typical schedule of a pastor. I don't do a lot of the things that a typical pastor would do, especially in the South. Um, and so my church has had to make a lot of accommodations for the things that, I, that I'm challenged with. Uh, but what it has done is it's made me really strong into two or three things that I'm really good at. Uh, and then also, and I mentioned this before, is to appoint persons with disabilities to leadership to help have a voice in crafting that environment. And, and all these are, are uh, ideas and theories and principles that we found that have helped me, um, not just as a person with disability, but also as a Black pastor, pastoring a multi-ethnic church. Um, and there's a lot of intersectionality there that I also talk about in my book, but those are the principles that have helped us to craft an environment uh, to help me reach my ideal success and the church to reach its ideal success in reaching people in the community with disabilities. So uh, last thing I'll share is, um, as Deborah mentioned, I do have a new book with Andrew Varsity Press releasing in just a few weeks. Uh, and so what they have done is if you would like to purchase the book, uh, the code is on the screen. There's a 30% off uh, and free shipping with that code. And that code will expire on February 28th. So if you want to take advantage of purchasing disability in the church, and a lot of what I covered uh, today is in, in that book in depth, um, you can uh, grab that code off the screen uh, and get 30% off and free shipping. Uh, for that book. And I like to joke that all the proceeds 
of my book goes to feed hungry children, my children. So uh, we would definitely <laughs> appreciate your support. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much um, for sharing your personal experience with us. Um, so insightful and helpful. Uh, at this point, we invite our other panelists to um, join us and um, perhaps take about 10 minutes to um, talk to you about some of the issues you've raised, some of the questions they might have. Uh, and we'll keep in mind that much of what we don't cover will be the topic for our final panel. Um, we understand and anticipate that often more questions uh, are raised than answers um, obtained through, through our exchange. So uh, I will turn this over to, to the three of you, but also in the interim invite our participants to um, type in any questions you might have uh, into the chat box uh, so that we can um, bring those questions as well. Uh, and uh, we'll do that after the panelists themselves have a chance to, to speak with Reverend Hardwick. So uh, Luchara, uh, Latanya, thank you both for, for joining us now. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you, um, Dr. Hardwick. I tell you, um, you just said so much, and I was inspired um, by so much of what you said, but I think there are two points that really stuck out um, and resonated with me. And, and number one was the role of the gatekeeper. And I think frequently when we look at how we can best support individuals with disabilities and their families in truly maximizing the gifts that God has given them within our church environments, it comes through the gatekeeper. There's always a gatekeeper. And, you know, if the gatekeeper asked you to spell Czechoslovakia, but God told you to have everybody spell love, then that's really and truly walking in disobedience. And, um, and, and that, that, as much as I laughed, I mean, I was laughing during that story, but it's not funny, right? Because we are being, if, if we are preventing people from walking in their areas of giftedness because of our own, our own issues, that's problematic. And I think that sometimes we have to um, look at our motivation behind our action. And I think that that's, that's kind of where things are coming from as I heard you sharing that. You know, we have to look at what are we doing? How do we respond? And how do we correct our actions? So that, that, that's my first point, but I, I wanna give Dr. Penny, give you a chance to, to hop in here because I, I could go on, this was so rich. I wanna highlight a different portion, but I did love that gatekeeper. And so the first time I tell that story in a sermon, I will give you credit. The second or the third time, it's my story. <laughs> okay? uh, that's just how, how preaching works. I'll give you credit that's how we do time. it. I understand. Uh, this, the concept of environment. Oh, the, I took a lot of notes on that. And um, using that seed story was very powerful. I think so much, like you said, so much emphasis is placed on the person with the disability, but we're not looking at the environment in which we put uh, persons with or expect them to function in. So we want mm -hmm. people to come to a perfect little church box and fit into the environment instead of making sure that environment is conducive for them. And um, that was something I really hold on to and took notes on. Um, so again, I'm gonna give you credit the first time. Um, then after that, uh, <laughs> it, it's all my idea on that one. Um, but I do think we really need to think about that. There was a question that I saw that I thought perfectly went with this. It said uh, from Bill Gaventa, say some more about how you see disability and diversity linking to each other in building a more inclusive community that welcomes a variety of differences. I think it's one and the same, right? I think mm -hmm. when we think of diversity, 
so much emphasis has been placed on race and um, or uh, ethnicity, <clears throat> but we're not thinking about diversity when it comes to um, making sure all abilities are at the table. So, so we're quick to say, well, we've got three black people and four white people and uh, two Hispanics, four non-English speakers, two English speakers. We, we're quick to do that checklist, but we don't think of diversity as including all abilities and realizing that just because you have one person who presents with a disability doesn't mean you're covering all disabilities. So you uh, said that you are on the autism spectrum. So that's a whole different spectrum than someone who has a CP or someone who um, has uh, other social anxieties. So we have to think broad, like you said, about making those environments um, conducive for all diverse kinds of um, abilities. Yeah, I, I, I would say answer the question um, and I talk about this, that's actually sort of the premise of the book is is to expand our definition of diversity. Um, and so I wrote it because, you know, diversity and inclusion is such a hot button issue in our culture and the church has hopped aboard and they should have should be uh, leading the charge in that. Um, but if, if you look at the data, and I think it's the World Health Organization and maybe a couple of other places that say that the largest minority group in the world is persons with disabilities. And so if we're going to have a discussion about diversity, which is basically saying uh, we've been lacking uh, certain voices in the room and certain voices at the table that have helped shape our society, has helped shape our mores and our norms, um, it's helped shape even our churches, uh, but there's been a certain segment of voices that have been absent. A lot of the charge has been ethnic diversity and racial diversity because those voices have definitely been missing. But if we're talking about diversity in its truest sense, um, which is inviting the minority voices to the table, the largest minority group in the world is persons with disabilities. And a lot of how our society uh, and even a lot of how our churches have been shaped, especially in the West, have been shaped without those voices being present at the table. And so it's no wonder why we have a difficult time having a diverse church when it comes to people of diverse abilities, because we've shaped and built churches that lacked those voices speaking into what the environment should look like if you want to be inclusive. And so there's, you know, there's that tie in and then also uh, one of the most natural ties is that the disability rights uh, movement is a grandchild of the civil rights movement. And so uh, uh, there's a close connection there that the playbook that the disability rights movement uh, began from was from the civil rights movement, which we know was birthed out of the church. So there's a natural connection there that I think we need to further explore. Uh, explore. And I also think that if we if we can get disability uh, inclusion right, I think will actually help us in our efforts to get ethnic and racial diversity right. Um, and so those are just some of my thoughts on the answer and some of, this, some of which I talk about in the book as well. So I'm wondering, um, you know, it's interesting. I think you've just brought together the two points, um, uh, Dr. Wallace and Dr. Penny's um, questions, which is, it strikes me that um, in order to ensure full access and equitable access, the presence of a gatekeeper or not may well dictate our success in um, being open and welcoming to, to all who seek to come in. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, about um, the beauty of the notion that if we really develop um, a, a means towards full accessibility in our churches and houses of worship to people with disabilities, how that starts to address the broader issues of, of equity and equitable access and um, delegitimizing the notion of marginalization of peoples and really uh, striving for full inclusion. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and what you see as that 
intersection? Well, I'll, I'll start and I'll be brief because I'd love for my colleagues to jump in. I think for me, the, the top of, um, at the top of the list is, um, and this may be a generalization, but I, I believe it to be true, is um, to be inclusive of persons uh, with, di with, with uh, disabilities or diverse abilities uh, requires a deeper level of commitment to true community. Uh, and so for me, I think, and you see that throughout the gospels, um, really, and I talk about this a little bit in the book too, is that Jesus's healing ministry was primarily about restoring marginalized group of people, those persons with disabilities back into community. I think it requires a different, a different level of commitment to community that I think we lack. And if we can learn how to uh, do that, uh, it can translate over into the racial and ethnic, because right now uh, we're pushing for it, but a lot of it has been uh, surface level, which is why we're seeing a lot of the anger and frustration because there's been a lack of commitment to true community. And I think we learn from the disability community, we learn from having to really engage uh, more than just on a service level, the value of the true community, uh, the beloved community, as Dr. King would call it, that God is building. And it, and it gives us the trajectory that's needed, I think, to, to have a firmer and more solid foundation on addressing the ethnic and racial tensions in our, in our world and primarily in our country. Can you speak to some of the um, barriers or pitfalls that we all can run into? Um, you know, um, in addressing this this notion of the openness that is required to to um, to really um, connect with people where they are. Um, and, and the difficulty that I think we run into sometime between thinking we know what others need and want versus really stepping back to hear what it is that a person themselves wants and the assumptions that are made and the underlying beliefs um, that uh, often drive the way we respond, the notion of charity versus true connection and friendship. I mean, these are things that ha we've been talking about over the course of the webinar, and I think we'll want to explore further, but I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of insight into that um, now in, that, in the context of this beautiful vision of achieving full um, inclusion to all who, to all. Can I jump in? Uh -huh. Please. Um, one of the things that I want to point to is part of the work that we're doing at All Belong is making sure when we're thinking about working with churches is, are, do we have the right people at the table and do we have the pe right people with the right mindset? So if you don't have fundamental people in the community or in the church committed to making the needed changes, it's going to always be surface. So when you get the right buy-in and the right attitude of we are determined to be welcome to all, we are determined to be inclusive of all, we are determined to make sure that we go beyond our comfort zones to move into accessibility and belonging. So it's one thing to say we have a ramp at the door, so you're welcome. No, it's, it's another thing to change the daggone door or remove the steps and make it completely a ramp. It is embracing the community and what they need and what every person needs when they show up at your um, church or in your community. So it's beyond saying, let's talk about it. Let's, let's make some revisions. It is a full commitment to bring everyone to the same space. And when we do that, we level the playing field. So if we're doing that in uh, with varied abilities and we're making sure we're thinking outside of the box, I think it'll be a natural progression for us to begin to see that diversion and that, that excuse me, that diversity when it comes to different races, because the, the word will get out. 
that this place is inclusive. They are, they are really a community. They stick together. They are, you know, removing barriers. And guess what? People will begin to come with that same mindset. And it also takes preachers like Dr. Hardwick willing to preach the word, willing to be open, people of color willing to talk about disability, uh, mothers willing to sit down and say, my children have disabilities and this is what we need. We have to get rid of that shame. We have to move from hiding things and move to a space where we're willing to say, these are the things that are in my bag. This is what I carry. I'm laying it out. Is there room for me here at this table? And once we do that on this level, it makes it more comfortable, makes it more uh, a more conducive environment that is more welcoming so that we move from just allowing people to show up to people wanting to belong. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Victoria said in the chat, universal design, right? And, and I know, and, th and that's kind of like my immediate response, universal design. But I would challenge that and say universal design plus, because frequently when we think about universal design, we think about what we're doing for someone and or what we're doing to people. And, and I would say universal design plus because it becomes, this is how it benefits all of us. You know, like how, how is it, let's start to consider how the changes that we're making makes all of us stronger, is it makes the entire church experience more suitable for everyone. Um, for example, I really appreciate how many churches now, um, they project either the scripture on a large screen or they project the lyrics to a song on a large screen. And that's beneficial in two ways, because number one, anyone who struggles with their sight, maybe you're visually impaired, no matter, no matter for what reason, whether it's because you were born, as you would say, um, with a disability, with a visual impairment, or, or, or because you're aging, because we know that disability is a natural part of the human condition. And each and every single one of us will experience some level of disability in our lifetime. You know, whether it's because you've gotten older and you just can't read those hymnals, or those individuals that can't read music and get totally distracted distracted by that, but by having the music and the words or by having the Bible, because if you're a new Christian, it might take you longer to find, you know, where Leviticus is uh, compared to something else. You know, you remove barriers that benefit all of us. And so when I think about Universal Plus or Universal Design Plus, I think about how, how is what we're doing beneficial for our collective? How, you know, let's start to consider how embracing and including all the members of our congregation, how it makes our congregation um, richer. Um, you know, as I'm not a preacher, but I tell lots of stories. So I think about the fact that the two most brilliant individuals that I know are two individuals that have some of the most significant disabilities that, that a person could have. Um, my, one of my best friends from, from graduate school is a woman who, has, um, who is legally blind. She, has, um, she experienced a, an acute accident, an acute trauma that severed, um, her, that, that sever, severed her, her, gosh, I can't even remember what it is. But anyway, it, it, she can't see light. She can't distinguish light from, um, from darkness at this point. But the woman is brilliant, brilliant, so way smarter than I am. You know, she should be on somebody's faculty and not me. Like that, that's what I'm talking about. But because we have blocks in our society with what, what we think it will take to include her in church ministry, to include her in faculty, to include her actively in life, she has not been able to get a job since earning her PhD. To me, that is, that, that, that's a sin. Right. So if we keep if we keep throwing up these barriers, I go back to the gatekeeper because sometimes, you know, it's, it shouldn't always be on the individual with a disability to invent their own church. Right. Let's make sure that we are providing opportunities for people to be able to rise and do what they need to do and do what they've been called to do without thinking about, well, how is this going to affect me? 
Is it going to make my life more complicated? Am I going to have to work a little bit more? Because honestly, if we start looking at how we're benefiting those around us, what we start to see is that you no longer are thinking about how it impacts you. You're now thinking about our world is just not complete without. And, and, and I'm going to jump in here in the interest of time, because I think that what you're saying, Luchara, um, piggyback so beautifully on what um, Lamar talked about and what Latanya shared in terms of her vision of how we truly achieve full um, equality and and um, and integration of all people um, it really is our challenge. I, I have to say that I always get a little nervous about um, the word universal design because I'm always a little bit afraid that that's a cop out for see we did it check it off. I don't think in the end it's about the universal design. That's just the starting place. It's the individual accommodation to what it takes. We have some comments in um, in our chat now about being understood as a person with a disability who may be advocating for themselves and being heard instead as being oppositional or. Um, or negative. It's about um, uh, the gifted person who is misunderstood. And so despite having the PhD and being fully capable, is struggling to find a job. Um, I think that, that I, I, the suggestion is responsive design. I love that. And mm -hmm. the openness to hearing how to respond, to whom to respond, whose response, who needs design. Um, that's our challenge. And I think what you've done, and as Latanya, as you were speaking, all I kept thinking is that's the topic for our final, for our final webinar. That is in fact what I think um, we want to be looking at some of the questions that and, and comments that have been put in our chat room really summarize very beautifully this this challenge for all of us. And in order to do that, we also have to understand the particularities of each of us. Um, and so to go back to our topic, which is to understand for those of us who are white, who are not Christian, for those of us who support folks or work with the, people, the direct support professionals who uh, do the supporting, helping us to begin to, to understand how, what are the conversations? What are we looking for? How do we open ourselves up to that ability and that capacity to um, create a church for all? Um, I think is, is, I mean, it's an answer that we will all be working on for a long time, but you've given us so much food to thought for thought, and you've given us so much opportunity to explore this a little further. Um, that what I want to say to those of you who've been commenting in the chat room, we will save your comments um, to our panelists. I can't thank you enough for providing such a beautiful. Um, opportunity for us to think about this important challenge we're facing today uh, and always. And um, I invite everybody to stay tuned and come back um, for more because our panelists are going to be able to help us explore and, and think about some, some practical solutions as well. So I'll turn it back to Sarah. Great, thank, thank you. All. you. And as Lamar shares the slides again, I just wanna thank you three again for your insights, your stories, um, and all of the questions that it's brought up and all of all of this, some of the simple and yet a little complex answers. It's, there's a lot we can do, but you just, you have a starting place, you listen, you get people involved, I love it. So if you have questions about today's presentation, um, you can contact Lamar Hardwick at his email address there. And again, we will be posting the slides um, on our website so that you'll have access to all of this information. 
If you have questions about the webinar series, of course, you can contact Deborah Fisher at her email. Next. And so here is our, um, our webinar series. We've gone through the first three. Now the last one, as has been said, the closing panel, you can see it at the bottom, is February 2nd at three o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And in that, again, we'll be continuing this conversation. Um, all three speakers will be there to share their insights, um, share practical information, share stories as well. And again, you may register for the closing panel by visiting our website. And you can see that at the top, aaiddreligion.org slash series. And feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues as well. Next. We do want to make you aware of a great opportunity. The Religion and Spirituality Interest Network of AAIDD is now accepting nominations for the 2021 Henry Nowen Award. The Nowen Award is bestowed upon individuals who reflect the compassion, commitment, ministry, and servanthood that values and esteems people with intellectual and de developmental disabilities. So we do hope you will consider nominating someone who exemplifies the spirit of inclusion through the work in their faith community. The award criteria, instructions for nominations, and contact information for any questions are posted on our Interest Network's website, and that's aaiddreligion.org. And then the Nowen Award is presented at the Religion and Spirituality Interest Networks Forum, which is a part of the AAIDD Annual Conference. This year's conference is scheduled for June 21st to 24th in Jacksonville, Florida. Next. So thank you so much for attending. We invite you to join our next webinar and you can also keep connected with the Interest Network. Of course, we have our website. We share information um, via Facebook and Twitter. And then you can also stay connected and learn about future events by signing up in our, it's, it's called a newsletter sign up right now, um, but sometimes it'll just be announcement of future events on there as well. So, on behalf of AAIDD's Religion and Spirituality Interest Network and the University of Minnesota's Institute on Community Integration, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Again, it has been recorded and we will post it to our website in the near future with um, the PowerPoint as well. Thank you so much.